Hi, this is Dr. Davis, and welcome to Lecture 3, Selection and Interview. In this module's lecture, we're going to look at these two next steps uh, that take place after recruiting has been completed, is the selection and interview of the candidates. And part of this selection process is going to talk a bit about uh, the job model and, and how we get that information out so that people can apply for the position. So it does a little of that, but the, the bulk of today's session is going to focus mainly on that interview process and, and how we determine who is the best candidate applicant for the job. So let's go ahead and get started. Slide two kind of gives you the plan for what we'll do uh, together with this lecture. I'm not going to say half of it focuses on selection, but in that selection process, I want to show you a, a model, uh, a flowchart of the selection process. That'll be a separate document. There's a picture of it here in the presentation. But I've also got a full-size version and a little podcast that will go with it. So that'll be something you'll be directed to later on. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, the job model and, and the skills that are associated with every job, whether they are job-specific or, or non-specific skills. The remainder of our time together today, we'll then look at uh, the interview process. So once people have applied for the job, how do we actually then make the determination for uh, one candidate over uh, another? You probably know this by now, but I am a big advocate for defining objectives. What is it that we're trying to accomplish in whatever activity we're involved in? I don't like things that are unnecessarily vague. Let's take some time and delineate uh, what the objectives are. What are we trying to achieve? So in the selection process, there are certain objectives that we are trying to accomplish. And, and that first objective uh, deals with the applicant or the candidate to determine whether they have the the knowledge, the, the ability, the skills to be effective in the position. That's really the, the ultimate objective is we want to find the right person for the, the right job. And right by, by meaning we're talking about they possess the skills to be effective. Secondly, I think we have an obligation to our applicants to make sure that they are making informed decisions about the positions that they want to accept. I don't want people working for me that are just doing it because they need a job. I want them to work because they believe in, in the organization uh, that, to which they want to commit, that they understand uh, what the, uh, the mission is of this organization and, and it's in line with their views as well. Thirdly, this process needs to create a, a sense of commitment. That's what we want the people to do, that they are becoming part of an organization and that they are going to commit to uh, its ultimate goals and objectives. And then finally, we want to communicate to this employee, this potential employee at least, that we're going to provide the support that they need to be successful that it's not all on them, it, there is something for the organization to do. It's, it's not like you hear in some of the old, old comedy routines, you're working for a song and then you have to sing it yourself. I don't expect them to come in and be effective if I am not providing them with the resources that they need in order to be effective. So they have the curriculum that they need. They have the technology that they need. They have the support in the classroom when it comes to behavior, and they, they have parental support as well. So there are objectives uh, to this, this selection process, and we want to make sure that all the applicants understand what the goals of this process are and how they can be a part of this process and know that they're making the right decision. How do we know they have the knowledge, skills, and ability to be effective at, at the school where they're applying? That is indeed the central question 
to uh, the interviewer. And it's the reason we're having the selection process is to determine whether this person sitting in front of us really does possess what they need to possess in order to be effective. But here's the, the rub. Many employers start interviews without fully identifying the criteria that are related to the success in, in the job. They are trying to hire a teacher. And so they ask these questions, many of which come from the central office. They're, they're structured questions. They're boilerplate questions. They ask them, ah, if the person sounds good, we'll hire them. And then the same principal is shocked when this person self-destructs partway through the school year or is less than effective at the end of the school year. A lot of this falls back on the school leader who has not done his or her homework to determine what exactly it's going to take in order to be effective. So the principal needs to ask this question first. What will the effective teacher look like at my school? Because to be effective at my school is a little different than the school down the road. Because we serve different students, just stands to reason. We serve different students, work with different parents, have different forces and, and barriers and opportunities in other schools. So we need to identify those so that we can then accurately design a picture of the skills that are needed in terms of the challenges this person is going to encounter. Typically, we break down the skills for effectiveness in the classroom into two categories. And this is not just education, this is uh, employment across the, the spectrum. First set of skills, uh, the most important set of skills, are the job specific. So for each job, they're going to have different skills. And then there are the general or non-job specific skills. So specific skills are those that are vital to uh, successful performance of the job. You can't do this job effectively if you don't have skills X, Y, Z. Then on the other side, the non-job specific skills are those that are, are skills that would be good for any job. They would help you to be good uh, and effective employee no matter what you were doing, whether you were making widgets, working on a, an assembly line, or teaching at a university. So take a look at the skills that you see here, and you can then see the difference between them. Uh, a job-specific skill, to be a teacher, you have to have a college degree. You have to have passed the praxis exam. You've got to be certified. Uh, you may need a foreign language if you're teaching a foreign language subject. But then on the other side of it, you've got skills that would help you to be an effective employee no matter what you were doing. Punctuality, positive attitude able to cooperate with co-workers, drug and alcohol free, so you're not addicted to uh, an illegal drug or a prescription drug. Those are skills that would help you to be effective everywhere. So that's why we break them down. And when it comes to the interview, it's nice if they have the job skills on the right, the non-specific, but more important that they have job-specific skills. Here's the flowchart I told you about. It is the uh, visual representation of how an application might travel through the selection process and become part of an interview pool. Now, this is going to be different from district to district, but it's a general, it's a generalized representation of the process that happens. And and like I said, there's a separate document on this week's module that you can actually look at this in a much larger form, and there's an accompanying little podcast with it. But this will show you uh, the filter points and decision points, and then what happens at, at the very end of this process. So more about this in that separate little podcast. As you are preparing those job-specific skills and the job model, you need to be aware of another aspect of this, which is determining essential functions and how this job and the skills relate to the Americans with Disability Act. 
Remember, you looked at that in the previous module. You read the act. You read about what it does and how it functions and how we must comply with it. So as you're looking at the skills and, and abilities a person must have, Essential functions are defined as those things that are fundamental to a particular job and that they are ones that an employee must possess in order to do the job to be considered qualified for it. So here's a, a fundamental job function uh, requirement. They have to demonstrate that they have current state certification in the subject area related to the vacancy. So if they have certification in English and they are applying for a mathematics position, they do not meet the essential uh, or, or fundamental function. And it would be okay then, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, to not consider this person for an opening at your school even though they may have a disability that would not prevent them from being an effective English teacher, they do not meet the fundamental requirement that they have math certification, which is why you will see this in job postings. They will say, must have certification in hand. Not that you're about to get certified or that you've applied for certification. If they say must have certification in hand, that is a, an essential function. They, they're telling you the school district doesn't want to wait for you to get certification. So uh, they, they want you to have it in hand. And so it becomes essential. So in this case, anybody who does not meet that essential function, that fundamental that, that's fundamental to the job, you can discriminate against them and not include them in the pool. So here's a, kind of a scenario. You have two equally qualified candidates. One has coaching experience and the other does not and is disabled. But coaching is not listed as a requirement in the vacancy. If you hire the applicant with coaching ability, what ends up happening? You're in violation of the Americans with Disability Act. Because remember, the operative words here are two equally qualified candidates. Now, if you had a job description that said, this position is tied to a coaching position. You must be able to coach baseball or track and field or whatever the, 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 the sport is. Then you could conceivably not hire the person that's disabled because if they are unable to perform the function, then there is no discrimination. It is a requirement for this position. In the same way, if um, a position has the requirement, applicants must possess a valid commercial driver's license in order to drive a bus. And if the person doesn't have it, again, you can uh, not include them in the interview pool because they do not meet that fundamental function and, and disability notwithstanding. Right, I know this question is already on your mind. How do we know if one of the, uh, the requirements is fundamental to the job? Well, think about this. It's fundamental if the number of tasks a particular position is created to perform, it requires that particular ability, that fundamental skill. For example, a school counselor having a CDL license. Hmm. Nice, but is it really necessary? Well, how many other employees already have a CDL license and can perform this task? If you already have a number of people with a CDL license, then you're probably not going to be able to convince the Equal Opportunity Commission uh, that this is a necessary requirement to have a school counselor with a CDL. Next is, the, other, the next criteria deals with what was the person hired to do? Uh, was the school counselor hired to drive a bus or to be a guidance counselor? Well, of course, it's obvious that we hired this person to be a guidance counselor. Then driving the bus is not an essential requirement for this job. But 
let's take out guidance counselor and, and put in athletic director. Uh, let's put in a PE teacher at a high school. And then having a, a city hall license. Now that's different. Because again, in that case, it is more understandable that the coach is going to need to be a driver of a bus to take the, the, the team to whatever athletic event it is. That is a more supportable requirement and fundamentals of the job because bus drivers are not available uh, to do this, so the coach has to be available to do it. So you see the difference there? We know it's essential because it, the position was created to perform a particular task, and if that task involves the, the expectation of a CDL license, well, then we know then it is, it is a fundamental part of that job. Between the two, non-job specific and job specific, which should get the most weight when we're evaluating the interview and, and, and evaluating the applicant? I believe job specific skills because that's the most important ones that we have. They're related to the job. I mean, the other skills obviously are important and we, we don't want to discount them uh, or ignore them, but job specific skills are the skills that are going to help this person to effectively achieve the expectations of the job. So yes, definitely job specific skills are always going to get, get, garner the most important weight. So let's look at selection criteria, things that we should consider uh, when we are deciding whether this application fits the expectations of the job and should be included in the interview pool or should be rejected. So first of all, we, we need to specify what the criteria is uh, on which these applications are going to be judged. What is the requirement? And, and some of this is going to involve, do they meet the minimum requirements of the job? And they have certification, they, they've got uh, you know, years of teaching, yes, but they're certified, and they're certified in the state of Alabama. Uh, you know, what is that minimal uh, level of criteria? But then we have this other issue of, hmm, what are we really matching this person up against? The job description? Or what I advocate for is a job model. Now, how are these two things different? You know, you'll hear people say job description, job model, and they use them interchangeably. I don't, because I believe they serve two different purposes. Uh, and and a job posting is is not the same as a job model. Uh, a job description basically gives information about the opening. It will not indicate the, the school or the what the school is like. It will basically say what the position is and uh, it will give you the requirements in order to be considered for it. That's it. A job model, on the other hand, uh, does not focus so much on the opening, the position itself, but focuses on the results and the outcomes that need to be obtained. What does this person need to do in order to be successful? So you can see then job description versus job model changes the emphasis. The emphasis from choosing a candidate who matches the description we're looking for and the candidate who has the greatest likelihood of achieving what we want them to achieve. Now here's where this is different. Many school principals don't go into the interview with an idea of the outcomes that they want this person to achieve. Well, let me take that back. I think some of them go into it with the, the idea that I'm hiring a teacher. So long as they can teach, we're good to go. Well, then if that's all the criteria is, then that's all they're going to get. But in today's high-pressure environment, accountability-driven environment, you don't want somebody who can just teach and manage a classroom, keep it under control. You want somebody who's going to get these kids to learn so that they can demonstrate that learning on a standardized test and, and show growth and achievement. 
You see, there's a difference. Just teaching someone who can manage a classroom is way different from a person who can actually help kids learn, grow, and, and demonstrate that growth in a, in a standardized test. Well, you've seen job descriptions, uh, so I'm not going to spend any time showing you what that looks like, but I do want to spend my time talking about the job model. So here's what the model does. It gives an accurate picture of the good, bad, beautiful, and the ugly of your school. So here are some phrases that come from job models. So the student population is composed of children from high poverty neighborhoods. The school is equipped with the latest computer technology in every classroom and students are issued a Chromebook. Okay, so there you see that is an, and that's not all, that's just this little snippet of it. That gives an accurate picture of the environment where this position is located. Now, even with just this little bit of information, and, and believe me, a job model is going to be more than just this. Part of it, I would say half of it, will be just a very accurate description of, of the school. Without using the name of the school, even. But showing the school in, in its good light, this is where the test scores are. This is where the score ranks on, on the scale of A to F. This is the type of students we have. This is the population we serve. This is the assets that we have that will make this a good learning environment. And this is, these are the deficits that we have. We have an older building, so we struggle with uh, access to Wi-Fi. And now wait a minute, you're saying, hold, hold it, hold it, hold it. I don't want to tell a potential employee that we have deficits. My question to you is, why not? These people, this isn't their first rodeo, for many of them. They know that schools have deficits. So, if you don't tell them that, aren't they going to feel cheated when they get to your school and they expect Wi-Fi everywhere and you don't have it? Are they going to want to stay at your school? Probably not. Because... If it were me, I would begin to wonder, what else have I been lied about? You're going to have only you know, 20 kids in a classroom, and it turns out you have 35 or 32. Again, you need to show them the good, the bad, beautiful, and the ugly so that they understand. So that here's the key, so that the potential employee can make a decision about this school, whether they have what it takes to be effective there. Now, the model also includes the particular skills that they have to have to be effective, as well as the results you want them to achieve. In other words, you, you're going to go so far as to tell them how you want them to bring this class up to where it needs to be. This could even include Something along the lines of how you want this particular position to motivate parent involvement. You talk about that in your, your description in the job model, and that you have low, enroll, uh, enroll, low involvement of the parents, and that it will be critical to this, this position that the teacher be able to engage parents in, in the learning process with their children. You see, there are three parts to this model. The description, yes. The required skills, job-specific skills, non-job-specific skills. And then the results that you want them or outcomes that you want them to achieve. So when they know all of this in advance, they can make an accurate decision as to whether apply or don't apply. And I would rather people self-select out of the interview pool, say, no, this is not the school for me, rather than they apply and then find out a year into life at the school, this isn't the right school for them, and they're immediately looking to go elsewhere. And so you've invested a year in, in them, 
only to find that they've decided to go elsewhere. So again, that's why the job model can be so effective in uh, helping you find that, that candidate that's going to be the right fit for your school. So let's take a look at the, the three parts of the job model so that you understand uh, what, what we're talking about. There are three sections, and the way it's broken down is you begin with the results you're trying to achieve, what you're seeking. This is the outcomes to be accomplished by this teacher. And be very specific. What do you want them to be able to do? at the end of the year because this is actually what's going to work with their evaluation that this is part of their evaluation and did they achieve the outcomes that you set forth the second part of the uh, job model section maybe called a section is the environment this is where you talk about the characteristics of school the good the bad the ugly and the beautiful that's where that is and then the third part are the priority actions and these are the tasks to be performed on the job. You would include skills here. These are the skills they need to possess and the tasks that they need to be able to perform. So, motivating the disinterested learner, if that's a task that you, you know is important to this job, then that's going to be in this section. Now, some of the job tasks are indirect and some are direct. So priority actions, those are the, the tasks that need to be performed. Some of them may need this teacher to work with other people in order to achieve them and then get the results that you're trying to achieve. But other priority actions can be done by the teacher to get the outcomes that they're seeking. So if there are some tasks that require them to work on a committee, well then those will be indirectly achieved uh, versus those things that would be directly achieved by this job. And what you're going to evaluate them on then is those things that are directly achieved, the results you're seeking, not necessarily the things that are indirectly achieved because the variable there is they're having to work with another group, they're outside forces shaping that. So your evaluation really focuses on the priority actions that this teacher can achieve by himself or herself. How do we do it? Well, let's start with step one. These are the results that we're seeking. When we prepare a job model, we need to start with the end. It's kind of the Grant Wiggins backwards design model. What are the outcomes that the school wants to achieve? Or the grade level, maybe, uh, would be another way to it. So begin with this question, and, and, and I think this is just the easiest way to do it. A person in this job is effective if he or she produces a result that blank. So an effective fourth grade teacher produces a result that is, ask five people that question, and then take their answers and rank the answers from one to five, one being the most important, the best answer, five being the worst answer. Now remember, the result here has to be tangible, got to be measurable, observable. It's also got to contribute to the overall mission of, of the school. So, uh, you know, thinking about a outcome here, result, I, I suppose you could, could put this as a requirement that all students will make adequate progress uh, on achieving benchmarks and adequate progress defined by what your school district has set as the benchmark. All students in kindergarten will read 100 words, you know, by the end of the first nine weeks. So again, you set those benchmarks. That's really what the outcomes are. The results you're seeking are the benchmarks for the job. So you start with those first. This is what the person has to be able to do. They have to not only monitor student progress, but they have to get all students to that adequate benchmark. They've got to get them from where they are to benchmark by certain time frames throughout the school year. So start with the, the results first. Let me define here how actions are different than results. Now the priority actions we're talking about 
our verbs managing, encouraging, coordinating, uh, motivating, those are actions. Results are things about being, how persons will behave. So we talked about books are, coaches understand, students are. Priority actions are the things that contribute to achieving the results. Again, they go back to the skills, the skills that are going to be necessary to achieve those desired outcomes or results. So the next part of your job model is going to require that you describe the environment of the school. And this is the one that makes people really nervous because they don't want to talk about the bad things of their school. They don't want to quote unquote bad mouth their school. But I think that if you really want the right person for the job, you need to tell them all about the job. Because if they find out where the job is, they're going to do some homework before they come for the interview anyway. They're going to know what your test results are. They're going to drive by your school. They're going to see the condition of the playground. They're going to see the condition of the facilities. They're going to talk to people about your school. So you might as well tell them up front anyway, because if anybody, any candidate for a job, if they don't go and research this information, and with the Internet, uh, it's easy to find this information, you're crazy. You might as well go ahead and tell them anyway. All right, so what you do in order to really adequately describe this environment is you find people who know the school, and you ask them to identify the forces and conditions that facilitate the achievement of the school's mission and those conditions that hinder the achieving of of the school mission and and the kinds of things that uh, the school is wanting to do. So, for instance, teacher or student performance could be a force that really facilitates the mission of the school, or student behavior could be one of those things that hinders. Parental involvement could be something that really uh, facilitates the achievement of the mission or it could be something that hinders it. Student absenteeism. You know, there's just a whole host of things you could plug in there. But you ask people, and facilities would be another good example of one that uh, you could put in there. So you ask people what those forces and conditions are. And then you rank them. The three most important facilitating forces are, and you like plus, the positive, positive one, positive two, positive three. And then rank the three most important hindering forces, negative one, negative two, negative three. And using these two categories, you create a narrative that describes the job environment. So you talk about the positive things. These are our three most important positives for working at, at John J. Adams Elementary School or Jefferson Davis Middle School. And then you also discuss the three challenges, the three conditions that are holding you back. Technology the infrastructure, uh, the population in the community, the facilities, whatever they are. You talk about those as well. That way you're giving a balanced picture to this candidate. And actually I think this will better serve you than, than just writing a, a description of the job. Let them see the environment. They know what a fourth grade teacher does if they've taught even two years. They know that. So I think it's better to give them a, a picture of where this will be done. Now, I haven't talked about this yet, but I'm going to kind of slip it in here. I think it would be a good place to do that. Most of these descriptions, job descriptions, are written by the Central Office Personnel Department. You might check with your school district to see if you can, as a principal, write your own uh, description of the job environment and and see if they will put that out uh, to the community uh, because I think you know, when you talk about this with your superintendent I think they're going to see the value of a job model versus a job description and if you describe the environment showing the positives and the negatives now they may say well we don't want to talk about any kind of negative 
well, then then you're deluding yourself because the people are going to find him out anyway. But I think they will see the wisdom in giving a balanced picture of your school. And uh, then if they, they, they will allow you to use that. And this is where you've got to check your school district out to see if they'll allow you to use this. The third step involves determining priority actions. And, and the way you do that is you ask yourself the question, how important is it that the person in this position be able to do blank? Now, I've given you some things here as, as things to fill in that blank. Make presentations to parents or community groups. Prepare detailed lesson plans. Meet with parents to discuss student performance. How important is it that they are able to do those things? Rank that. Number two, how important is it that the person in this position have the following motivations? Produce a stable level of performance. Work within routines. Desires the goodwill and affection from people. Wants to acquire and use influence. Exercise leadership. Again, how, how much are they driven or impacted by those motivations? Because that will help you to focus in on the actions a person needs to take. So if detailed lesson plans are job critical then you're going to want to make that one of the most important priority actions. Prepare hands-on, engaging lessons. Then that's going to want to be one of your priority actions. That's a skill that they're going to have to have. And when you ask a question in the interview, you're going to want to ask questions that are related to that particular skill for them to talk about their lesson plan ability. And if the person says, well, you know, my lesson plans are more of a guide. I kind of write some notes down about what I'm going to do. But basically, when I get in the classroom, I just flow. And I just go, and, and we cover what we're going to cover, and then we move on to the next topic. Well, that type of answer is going to be a little bell should go off in your head saying, nah, this is not the right person for this job. I want detailed lesson plans. I want engaging lessons. Hey, this guy may be great, a great teacher, but it's not he doesn't or she doesn't possess the skill that you're really looking for to achieve the desired outcome. So again, asking those questions helps you to create uh, appropriate priority actions, things that they have to be able to do, skills that they have to possess in order to achieve those desired results, the outcomes. So why go to this, this trouble of preparing a job model? Well, first of all, it's going to show an accurate picture to the applicant of where they might be, be working. Secondly, it lets them know whether they actually have the ability to achieve the results that are sought. And, and I think that it's going to cause some people to not apply for your job, which is going to leave you with the people who really do want the job and can and can do the job as well as those people who are just applying for any job it's going to make it so much easier for you to tell the difference between the people who are just looking for any job and those who are really the talented people uh, it, this job model is going to help you create interview questions that will measure the outcome because you're going to focus your question on the actions that they have to take the skills that they have to have and uh, remember that if the and I think it is since the focus of human resource administration is on student learning then you want a tool that's going to help you determine whether this applicant sitting in front of you has the ability has the skills to achieve student learning where do we get our information about the applicant? Well, the neat thing is the applicant provides most, if not all, of the information about them. And it's our job to sift through the application, sift through the transcripts, their references, any test results that they provide, as well as comparing that information, that data, to the, what you learn from them about during the interview. 
I didn't list on this slide the using of the internet, but I am becoming more and more a fan of using the internet to check up on people. Now, I'm not saying necessarily doing background checks on them, although that's what some school districts do. They will do a, a Dun and Bradstreet uh, background check, which looks at their financials. And remember, when you sign the application, if you read the fine print at the bottom, it tells you that they, you're giving them permission to examine your background and use tools to look at your financials and a whole host of things. So don't be surprised when they do it. And school districts are doing that. There are, some school districts are obtaining software that allows them to search Facebook and Twitter and social media and and see what's out there on on you as a teacher what's being posted and i know of a school district local that looks at facebook pages and they look at pictures on facebook and this particular school board member told me that they had found applicants who had inappropriate pictures on their facebook page and that was a a factor in whether to hire them or not. In one case, uh, there was a teacher, and I don't know why a teacher would want to post this on a Facebook page, but posted a picture of himself with what appeared to be students. They were young teens, and he's got a can of beer in his hand, and it looks like they're all drinking as well. And I'm thinking, wow, why would you want that picture on, on the internet that someone, a potential employer, could find? Another uh, instance where I was told by a school board member, they, they had done a, a search of social media, and they found a picture of a female applicant where she's wearing something exceptionally revealing. And, and, and she was a beautiful person. But the problem is they were concerned about judgment. Is this the type of person that you know we would want to be teaching our 7th grade boys or our 5th grade kids? So uh, there's a lot of information out there. Plus, the Internet not only helps you to see the social media, but it can also help you find information about just background. Uh, I had looked up... Uh, someone one time to get some information on on where they were located. They had moved. I lost their address. I put their name and see if I could find anything about them. And I was surprised that there were newspaper articles about this person, and, and they were all good articles. But the issue was like, wow, there's newspaper articles, and then it talked about uh, uh, resumes that were still floating around out there that you could see. And I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize there was so much out on the Internet. So you may see the Internet as a tool that will help you obtain information about your applicants. But your goal should be to use the information that's out there and compare it with what you hear in the interview so that you get a more accurate picture of, of this person. The application itself is, is a very important tool to gather some of this information. Applications are, are already vetted by district attorneys, and so much of this is not going to show up on an application. But remember that you can only ask questions on an application that are related to the qualifications of performing the job. Anything else that's not related to that can't be on the application. Now, you can ask about previous or current criminal convictions, and especially if the crime pertains to uh, an occupational qualification, such as a sexual offense, drug offenses, things like that, driving uh, DUIs, you can ask those. Here are things you can ask about. You can ask about age, race, ethnic origin, religion, their sex, sexual orientation, all that kind of stuff. Even though you may ask for uh, demographic information because the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they 
they want this information. So you pre-employment forms, you can ask for that. It's all anonymous, and they don't have to, to do it. You cannot make it part of the interview. can't make it part of a condition of employment. But they do have that to gather the, the data on who's applying for what jobs. Now, there are some questions that are suspicious. Uh, asking about their marital status, uh, the number and age of their children, child care arrangements that they have, memberships with certain clubs and organizations. Those are all questions that would be very suspicious on an application uh, and even in an interview because uh, again there's a question of is that going to be something I am discriminated against. Now some interviewers will get around that by asking the applicant to tell them about themselves and you'll hear that a lot. Well, you start with a general question of, tell me about yourself. And then whatever this person volunteers is fair game. And then, of course, you can ask follow-up questions about things that they say. But, again, it can't show up on an application. Some HR people will tell you that they don't even bother with references, and, and by bother I'm saying they don't even bother checking them anymore, because they argue, well, how many letters of recommendation or references have ever said anything but positive things? So here's the question you ask yourself, why are they so positive? Well, some previous employers uh, don't want to provide any negative information because they're afraid of being sued, defamation of character, that kind of thing, or libel. Uh, other districts will only provide the name of the position and the dates of employment because, again, they're so concerned about being brought into court. We kept you from getting a job because you told us about this person. And I've, I've talked to those districts, and you're wasting your time. Most of the states now uh, have some form of immunity laws protecting those who give references uh, because of cases where there has been issues of child abuse or suspicions of child abuse, that doesn't get communicated. And, and sometimes the background checks, if, if they're not coordinating the background check with the FBI and the, the state level, Sometimes that interstate activity doesn't show up on, on the background check. So what I do with references, I check them. I, yeah, I read your letter of recommendation, but I focus more on who is writing the letter of recommendation. Is it their supervisor? Was it a colleague? You know, was it somebody that was like their boss 10 years ago? and yet their most recent boss, their current boss, isn't included. Now, now you could easily say, well, their current boss wouldn't be included because they don't want their current boss knowing that they're looking for a job. Okay, understand. But what about the job before that? Uh, do they have a reference from that supervisor? Who's giving them references? And, and references should you have expected but don't see? Who's not giving references? Look at the reference. What are they saying about the person? Are they saying, oh, he was a great guy, loved working with him, great to talk to, good friend, but doesn't address their ability to take students from point A to point B, manage the classroom, blah, blah, blah? Um, or is it all positive and no negative? Because see, even in a letter of reference, I think you can still talk about the negative, but not make it so devastating that you destroy the person. But talk about the, the, the fact the guy's a, a hard worker, but he tends to be an, a workaholic. Not saying you don't hire him, but just saying, well, you need to know. This guy did great things for us, but he tended to work here all the time. And, and you know, that wasn't effective either. So, again, I tell you, look at the references. It's a way to kind of help you triangulate the data that you're getting from references to application to uh, interview. We do require background checks here in Alabama. They, they do check at the state level, but they also check uh, the now national databases. Um, even if the background check comes back with no convictions, 
uh, look at dates on, on the background check, uh, look at uh, the resume that they provide uh, and compare it to the background checks, look at uh, any gaps that may show up in, in their, their work history. Because those are questions to ask. Well, I noticed that that there's a gap of ten years here in in your your background. You know what was going on during that time, and then they can say, well, you know, I was working out of the country or I was doing something different. Oh, okay. Well, just now I understand what you were doing. But give them a chance to explain those inconsistencies, especially inconsistencies in dates. Well, wait a minute. You said you worked here for these five years but then something you said over there made it look like you were only there two years so again those inconsistencies could be just errors and omissions but it's better to be sure what's actually going on so I I suggest that when you're doing those kind of background checks and looking at the resume even looking at the transcripts you know how what kind of student was this is this a D student a C student somebody who barely got by and Wow, okay, you know, they failed uh, the classroom management class three times. Okay, that might be something to be concerned about. Or teaching social studies, you know, they, they only got a C in that. Oh, okay, well, uh, or the diverse learners class when they were taking their special ed classes, they didn't get a grade above a B. Hmm, it might be something to consider or at least, you know, point out that, hey, I noticed in your uh, transcripts that, your grades here are, you know, they're average or they're below average. What What's going on? And they could tell you, well, you know, if you look at my resume, you'll see that during college I was a full-time employee and, and I went to college at night. Oh, okay. So, so in other words, what you're telling me is you were working and going to school. Understand. The key is to look at the data that you have and, and be able to examine those inconsistencies and have them explain the inconsistencies satisfactorily. So again, don't ignore data that you have because your goal in this process is to find the best teacher that you can. Let's talk about interviewing because this is really where I think you gather the most uh, useful data. Not saying the other data isn't helpful, but this is your real-time data. This is where you're sitting across the table, uh, across the desk from uh, a potential teacher. And, and this is where you're going to confirm or uh, throw out any conceptions that you've based on the documents you've received. This is where you're going to confirm that. You know, and this is where they're going to get a chance to explain those gaps and, and those admissions. Also, this is going to give you a chance to see how the person thinks on their feet. Interpersonal skills. Are they able to talk to people? Are they able to look the person in the eye that's talking to them? How they carry themselves, their, their manner, their demeanor, their style, all of that. As well as a chance for you to listen to how they communicate their ideas, express them. So... This is going to give you a chance, the interview will give you a chance to probe uh, and uh, what this person is saying and, and really drill down so that you can get an accurate reflection of who this person is and, and get those uh, real world answers that you want to do. Now, there is a challenge to the interview. There is interviewer bias. We'll talk about what those biases are. And we've got to be aware that we all have biases when it comes to interviews. And, and so let's, let's look at those here uh, coming up because I think that the, the bias will help us to be aware of them so we can control for them. So let's look at the types of bases then. Bias, I mean. Uh, the first one, a very hard one to control for, is the contrast effect. And this happens after we've interviewed uh, several candidates. We tend to compare the current candidate against the candidates we've already interviewed. And this is dangerous because one person may interview really well, but not match the criteria that we're supposed to be basing at this interview on. Remember that you're comparing them to the criteria, not to each other. And, and that's what we call the popularity contest 
uh, bias, where it's the one that we really like the most, and they're the most popular and the most engaging, whatever. Uh, again, you're comparing them to the criteria, not to each other. A second type is what they call the halo effect. This is where we kind of discount the negative information we hear and we attach a greater weight to the positive information that we're hearing. And maybe it's due to the fact that we like to, to think of things more in positive terms and so, oh well, yeah, I know there's some negative, we're going to ignore that negative information and focus on the positive. It's, it's also a hard one to kind of monitor, but you just need to be aware that you need to treat all information the same, give it the same amount of weight, no more, no less. Uh, the opposite of the halo effect, of course, is the negative information effect, which is where we attach more inf more weight to the negative information than we do uh, the positive. Again, balanced approach. Uh, a fourth type of bias is called confirmation bias. And what we tend to do is information that we obtain at the beginning of the interview is given the greatest amount of weight. We end up making up our minds based on the first five minutes of the interview. And then the rest of the interview is spent confirming what we've already decided we believe about this particular candidate. And we look for things then that support our uh, decision for this candidate. Instead of waiting until the interview is over and then making a decision, we, we listen for five minutes, oh yeah, this guy's great, he's awesome, he's going to do a great job in the class, and then we use the rest of the interview to support our reason for selecting this one. The final one is called social merit, uh, and as hard to believe as it is, it is a, a, a form of bias, we tend to look for the good-looking candidates. The ones with the nice complexion, the pretty smile, the beautiful hair, teeth, all that kind of stuff. And, and they tend to get the more positive ratings. Uh, I, I suspect that what's probably better in interviewing might be put, a, put the candidate behind a wall so all you can do is hear them and not necessarily see them is about the only way that you can get around the social merit bias. Uh, because again, that's, that's just part of our makeup. Be aware. It's not about how they look. It's listen to the substance of what they're saying and then make a decision on whether this candidate is a good match for your school. Well, there are several types of interviews uh, that are used in selecting candidates. The very first one is called the screening interview, and this doesn't involve you meeting the candidate at all. This particular one is a document review where you look at the application, transcripts, resumes, letters of recommendations, references, and all of that. You're looking just at the documents to see if the person has the professional qualifications for the job. And, and that's it. And that's what gets them through this process, uh, the selection process to begin with. Now, a selection interview is used in some cases uh, to just see which candidates you want to move further on through the process. It's usually less structured, uh, but takes longer. Uh, sometimes, and I think all the universities use these, they will do a telephone or uh, an internet, um, voice over internet interview. And based on that interview, it's, it's somewhat generic, I think, because I've participated in them. They're not asking questions necessarily about the job itself, but what they are trying to do is create a pool of candidates that they want to invite back for a more formalized interview that's going to help them determine who gets the job. It's a good tool if it works uh, at your school to do multiple interviews. A lot of schools, they don't want to take the time to do that. They kind of want to get this done, so they won't take the time for a selection interview. But it may help you to identify the pool of candidates, and then from that pool, then you select the ones you're going to actually interview. The final type is the one I told you about at the beginning of the presentation, which is called a behavioral interview. The premise of this type of interview is that 
past behavior is a good or excellent predictor of future performance. And so we're going to spend our time in, in this session looking at behavioral interviewing. I believe it is the best form of interviewing uh, for uh, finding candidates who can match a set of criteria because that's really how this interview works is you have to define criteria i.e. create the job model and then ask questions that are related to that job model instead of just asking a set of questions you're actually asking questions that are related to the job for which this person is applying not just a generic teaching job but specifically fourth grade specifically English specifically math so we're going to spend our time looking at behavioral interviewing central to behavioral interviewing is the interview question and behavioral interview questions are based on a skills analysis that's part of the job model where you identify to the desired outcomes and the priority actions that have to be taken so therefore these questions relate to those priority actions what does the person have to do to reach that desired outcome and that's where you're asking questions about them the questions are phrased in such a way that it forces the applicant to give real world, real experience answers, not the hypothetical. For example, let's say that the particular priority action involves motivating unmotivated parents, uninvolved parents. So you would ask the question this way, tell me about a time when you had a parent who would not come to conferences with you what did you do and you see here the way the question is arranged it's forcing them not to tell you what they would do but they have to think about a specific example of a time when they dealt with an uninvolved parent and how they engage them now the challenge comes down to what if they don't have any experience working with uninvolved parents mm, then that's a, that's a flag that's a, a red yellow green whatever color you want it to be that mm, this person may not be the right fit for your school because you have one of your your descriptors of your school is that the parents have historically been uninvolved in parent conferences and that's something you want to change well, this person may not be able to help you because they have not had any experience dealing with uninvolved parents. So that's what the, the beauty of these questions are. It, it helps to reveal the skills that they have or reveal the skills that they don't have. Slide uh, number 26 gives you some sample uh, behavioral interviewing questions, and you can read them here. I, I like these. Uh, give me an example of when you were assigned to a group project and someone did not do their part. What did you do? Give us an example of a time when you achieved a goal that you had set for yourself. How did you do it? What did you do? Give me an example of a goal you did not reach. How did you handle it? Describe a stressful situation at work and how you handled that situation. Again, see, all of these questions are designed to give you real answers. So those questions are just a few uh, examples. There are many more. Keep in mind that for every skill that you've identified, every priority action that you've identified in the job model, you must have at least one or two questions. Uh, so that you can really adequately test for that um, that skill, that, that action. The way the questions are phrased, is, there's a couple of ways you can do it. One is, tell me about a time when, or you can identify the skill and ask for an experience. With your experience, I'm sure you've encountered a difficult parent. How did you handle that parent? Or even a third way, not listed here, but like I showed you in the example uh, questions, you could say, give me an example of when you did this. All of these are forcing the people to tell you about true events and, and things that they have experienced. Remember, a man with experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And it's simply that once they've experienced it, if they've handled it successfully, they're probably going to be able to handle similar situations 
successfully because they have something to draw upon. First thing you'll notice is that behavioral interviewing does take more time. It's, it's a little bit more work, but it has some very distinct advantages. It forces the applicant to stay in the real world. They don't get to tell you about what they might do or what they would do. It forces them to say, this is what I've done. Now, hindsight may say, now nah, I wouldn't do that again. And that might be a nice follow-up question. Would you do it that way again? And then you can allow them to say, no, I, after looking at it, I wouldn't do it that way again. This is how I would do it. But first, you get that real-world answer. Secondly, it's going to give you some insight into their past behavior. Because remember, the premise of behavioral interviewing is the past is an excellent predictor of the future performance. So looking at their past is going to tell you about their future. Thirdly, these questions are tied to actual skills or actions that the applicant needs because remember, the priority actions are connected to the outcomes on which they will be evaluated each year. So you want to be able to know, do they have the skills, abilities, and, and resources in order to do an effective job? This is going to help you find that. Ultimately, finally, number four, it's going to help you as an interviewer to easily separate and know which applicants have the job skills that you're seeking. And it's going to, you're going to make the distinction between the people who are not qualified and the people who are overly qualified very easy. You're going to see that right away. And, and this is going to help you, I think, immensely. I'm a big advocate of it. I worked with a guy who really, I think, is the father of this, or at least he's the guy who, who brought it into the workforce, a guy by the name of Paul C. Green. He worked in a consulting firm when I was uh, teaching school uh, years ago, so it's, it's like 100 years ago, uh, in Memphis. He had a consulting firm, I think it was Herring and Green, and, and then he just went out on his own, uh, Green uh, Consulting, and he trained people in how to do behavioral interviewing. And I worked in the office, didn't work with him so much, but he would go out and do these trainings. And I helped prepare the materials and get all the materials ready to ship out to wherever the conference was. Like I said, it was really popular back in the, the mid to late 80s. Uh, and you kind of lose sight. Now everybody does behavioral interviewing, but he was one of the early ones, if not the father of it. And uh, I don't know if he's still alive today, uh, but I, I think I think he is. He still has people who are doing these conferences on how to do it. Again, just a great tool. So if you see anything on behavioral interviewing, uh, you know, look at it, and it'll be I think a useful tool to you as you interview at your school. Now, there is a major drawback to behavioral interview, interviewing. It really doesn't work as well with beginning teachers. And why is that? Because they have very little, if any, real-world teaching experience. So they don't have anything to draw from. You know, the beginning teacher probably didn't conduct a parent-teacher conference in their internship. Or they didn't deal with a particularly difficult parent during their internship. So while the internship is a good thing, the problem is you may not be able to make many conclusions based on it. So you're going to have to generalize your questions a little bit more rather than making them so focused on education. doesn't mean you don't use the skill, but uh, you definitely have to generalize the question. So here's an example. Tell me about a time when you had to deal with an annoying colleague. What did you do? So here you're substituting colleague for parent. Um, another thought is, is this, and, and I'm going to just throw this out to you, kind of a think about kind of a thing. If you know that you need somebody with experience in a particular job, then I probably would not give much credence to a beginning teacher when it comes to applying for that job. I might put into my interview pool only those people who have three or four years of teaching experience and more. I might not even consider brand new teachers. If I know that I'm in a 
difficult area. If I'm in a high poverty school with very, very difficult students, I don't think I would interview a, a brand new teacher unless that's all that applied. Because uh, I think you're, you're doing them a disservice, you're wasting your time, wasting their time. If you already know, they're not going to be effective. So uh, there are some drawbacks to this. This is just the major one that I could think of. There may be others. Uh, it doesn't, like I said, doesn't work well with uh, the beginning teacher. But you can kind of work around it by generalizing questions. I think every interview needs a rubric. This is, and I, and I'm advocating here rubric by question, not just a general rubric. Now you'll see out on the internet thousands of rubrics for interviews, and it kind of covers the overall interview. I think that if you're going to do behavioral interviewing, you need to have a rubric for each question. Maybe the same rubric, but that you use that rubric for every question. And you can decide how many elements that you're going to measure as a result. I just put one here as a sample. But you could have other ones such as demeanor. How do they carry themselves? Um, what's the style? What, what's their language like in this? Are they, do they use the professional language? Or are they more conversational? What, what's going on with the language? And so you can see here I listed content of their response. It was thorough. No need for follow-up. At the proficient level, one to two follow-up questions were needed in order to get information that would help you to understand what the applicant was saying. A developing answer might need three to four follow-up questions. Or a beginning response is there was, the question was not addressed at all. Kind of They, they went on a tangent uh, to the question, never really answered the question. Again, as you design a, a, an interview rubric, I would encourage you to look online at the samples out there. Um, you'll see some websites talk about not uh, having a question-by-question -question rubric, that they think it's better to do more of an overall. But I think that because your behavioral interviewing questions are directly related to a skill, you want to know which skill the student or the applicant has or the degree to which they have. Do they show mastery of the skill or are they just proficient? And I think that's important. Where are their deficits? Wow. Are there deficit in these two areas? And, and are those mission critical areas? So this is, I think, going to help you get better data on which to decide is this the right applicant to offer the position. This brings us to the end of lecture number three. One of the things I didn't talk about, and I'm kind of debating whether I want to bring it up here or not, but I think I'm just going to kind of throw it out there as uh, something to think about. I've been hearing from colleagues across the country that some school districts are actually going towards a an interview and a sample teaching uh, unit. And, and what they're doing is they're bringing the candidate in to teach a sample lesson for uh, a group of children so that the interview committee can look at how they interact with students. And now that's not unusual in higher ed. You know, when you come to work at a university, you do an interview and then you come in and you teach class and they make a decision based on, on whether you can teach the class, I guess, and, and how well you do on in the interview. But at the K-12 level, it's still very unusual. And I'm an advocate of that. I believe let's actually see them teach a unit and uh, bring in a group of students and have them work with that group of students for 45 minutes. Because in that 45 minutes, you're going to see very quickly uh, how they engage students, how they can manage the learning environment. It might be something to think about. I'm not saying you go and do it, but I think it's going to become more and more part of interviews as we, you know, we're trying to find those best teachers to have them come in and show us what they can do. I mean, they're going to tell us what they can do, but let's actually see them do it. Well, this will bring us to the end of, of this session and hope you are uh, able to understand everything that we've 
been saying here today on the selection and interview process. Don't forget there is a short podcast that takes you through that um, flowchart on selection. Take a listen to that as you have a chance uh, by the end of the week for sure. And uh, if you need me, contact me uh, via email. Look forward to hearing from you. Take care now.